Добрый день. Again, good morning. While the panelists are mounting the platform, may I um, begin um, introducing the participants? Um, Susan <coughs> Afi. Afi, she is professor of economics at Stanford University. She became the first woman to win a John Bates Clark Medal awarded to young American economists. She is doing research in digital economics, marketplace organization, machine learning, which are exactly the subjects we are going to discuss. She is also a member of the board of directors at several innovative companies, Ripple and Speedia Rover. On my left is Olga Dergunova, Vice President and Chair of the Board of ETB Bank. Olga has unique experience working both in banking and in government bodies. Before joining the VTB Bank, she was CEO of Microsoft Russia and Deputy Minister for Economic Development and Head of Rossimushistvo. Mikhail Osievsky is the president and chair of the board, uh, Ross Telecom. Earlier, he uh, was uh, vice governor of St. Petersburg, vice minister for economic development, vice president of VTB Bank. He has the degree of advanced uh, doctor of economics. Ram Siwak Sharma, he is a chairman of Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and is a head of the telecom regulator in India in charge of the telecoms and mass communications. Earlier, he used to work at the Electronics and Information Technology Ministry. He is known for his project uh, for uh, uh, introducing uh, unique identity projects in India, uh, one of the most uh, large-scale projects ever undertaken, which um, uh, permitted uh, biometric identification for uh, financial services to be uh, given to Indian citizens. Oleg Tinkoff is chairman of the board, uh, Tinkoff Bank. In the 1990s, he began his uh, entrepreneurial activities and founded a number of businesses. In 2006, Oleg acquired uh, the Moscow Bank, uh, Kimash Bank, and founded Russia's first ever uh, distance, uh, distance services uh, bank. Now, uh, we have uh, heard a lecture by our keynote speaker, Brett King. And as I have said, his books uh, like uh, Banks 3.0 uh, were uh, largely definitive in terms of uh, bankers' attitude toward um, digitalization and his uh, forecasts. Uh, Many of his forecasts uh, have turned into reality. Um, many banks uh, are um, reducing their physical presence as they realize that the future belongs to digital technologies. Banks are now present in social networks. They have reconsidered their relations with their clients. We have heard new um, some, some new projections by Brett King. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, what people need is uh, banking at any time, everywhere, uh, augmenting reality and uh, embedded in it. We may need to rethink um, the need uh, for many things that uh, we are accustomed to, like money, and it is quite obvious that the financial sector uh, is to create new business models and to review its place in today's world. Um, and in continuation of this, I would like uh, to ask Susan Athey. Uh, Susan, we have um, uh, gotten together for a third time at this forum. 
So myself and my colleagues um, uh, uh, can see uh, that uh, the audience has uh, two strong emotions, especially the financiers. Uh, one is anticipation of new prospects, uh, promising vistas associated with new technologies. And the second is apprehensions um, about um, digitalization in banking. And it's not a trivial question. What are the advantages of financial te new financial technologies to the uh, financial sector and uh, the risks and negative consequences that uh, this may entail? So I'd like you to set the tone uh, for our discussion um, so that we um, discuss in a practical and uh, rational way what are the main advantages of this uh, stormy development of financial technologies, but what are the risks uh, that you see and what prevails, the risks or advantages? Um, this is not a trivial question. We all emphasize the prospects associated with new technologies, but you can see that many of the players and uh, those who have done a lot for technological development like Elon Musk and Facebook, they uh, make decisions that are associated with certain uh, threats uh, and associated with artificial intelligence. So what do you think? Thank you for having me here today. These are excellent questions, and we all need to consider both the benefits and the risks. First, of course, finance was meant to be digital. If we started today to build the system, of course, it would be digital. It would be instant. And most of the processes that banks worry about today would be completely automated. In fact, when finance is instant and digital, many processes become obsolete. Uh, I'm on the board of Ripple. One of our investors is Seagate, who pays uh, suppliers all over the world. Seagate has a group of people whose job it is to track down failed payments. Now, if payments are instant and the information flows along with the payment immediately, you don't need the department that tracks down failed payments, and you don't need the risk management. You don't need the, the processes to think about what, what you do when you have hundreds of millions of dollars in transit from one company to another. On the consumer side, if you're buying a home, you need a contract that has contingencies for what happens if you don't get your financing. All of those processes and risks disappear when we have instant availability of information to the lenders and when people can act on that information immediately. So our systems become much more efficient and entire processes uh, become unnecessary. We, we also see changes in industry structure. We can see smaller banks compete globally when they don't have to ride the rails of larger banks and pay their fees. We see that companies have more of a global reach when they can make payments throughout the world. And of course, inclusion for individuals as well. If we make the cost of serving individuals very low, we can therefore um, serve more individuals. We also can offer individuals better ways to save. They don't have to have gold necklaces on their neck. They don't have to have things stuffed in their mattresses when they have access to international financial markets. When all of this comes on board, more of the economy goes above ground. That also helps with taxation and allows us to lower marginal tax rates if everybody's paying tax. And that allows the economy to be more efficient. And I generally believe that many of these innovations will be passed on to consumers and business customers through competition. Um, not all innovation 
does get passed on to consumers. If you have uh, an, an automated factory, but the firm making products has monopoly power, they might reduce costs, but not lower prices to consumers. But I believe that in the financial sector, as payments become instantaneous and as costs come out of the system, much of that will flow to the rest of the economy, benefiting economic growth globally, and particularly benefiting countries that suffer today from high frictions and inability to make global payments. In parts of the world, it can take two weeks to get money from the US to those places, and they just can't be part of the global economy under those circumstances. Okay, what about the risks? First of all, it is very hard to be a software firm. I was consulting chief economist for Microsoft for a number of years, and I worked on the search engine. It was hard for Microsoft to learn to manage a search engine. They had been shipping software every three years. That requires different management than shipping new algorithms to consumers every week. And for several years, the management struggled to adapt to the new world. If, if a technology company has trouble changing from 1.0 software to 2.0 software, what does that mean for banks? I go to conferences where every CEO says, we're a technology company. And I watch those CEOs and I realize it's true. They must become technology companies, but they will not all become technology companies. Some will die because it's just so difficult. Another challenge is that although machine learning and AI have made great advances, they've made great advances at simple things. Identifying images, classification. I can, I can see cat videos on YouTube and understand that they are cats. But that doesn't mean that we understand how to make complex systems. So inside the search engine, we made mistakes. We tested things on 1% of consumers, but it was very different when we, we changed things for all consumers. There were feedback effects. There were equilibrium effects inside the software systems. A small test does not predict what happens when something goes out to the whole economy. And we really don't know how to deal with those feedback effects. If you're in traffic and you're, you're say in the US we use Google Maps, Google Maps tells me to turn left to get out of a traffic jam. Suddenly everybody turns left. And then we all get in a traffic jam getting back on the road. Those types of equilibrium effects will become more pronounced and we will face systematic risks. And, and, and the engineers, even the best engineers and the best technology companies, really don't know how to predict those risks. The science isn't there in the universities and the experience isn't there. Another risk I worry about is the risk of platforms. So it's very exciting that the platforms are pushing technological innovation. It's exciting that Uber is helping get their drivers banked. At the same time, some of these platforms also have market power. Um, certainly, you know, today, instead of using my, my Visa card or my regular American Express card on Amazon, Amazon gives me 5% cash back when I use the Amazon card on Amazon, 5%. Of course, Amazon sees the inefficiencies of the payment system. It's so large, it's going to push efficiencies and perhaps take it over itself. And in those cases, today, Amazon shares benefits with consumers, but some of these technology platforms may not. We see Apple Pay adding a fee onto every time you use the credit card inside Apple Pay and not allowing the banks to have their own payment apps using NFC communication. They can do that because they have market power over consumers. So some of the intermediaries um, may take a cut and not pass all the benefits over to consumers. Um, finally, of course, we all worry about employment. And I do see that, that financial institutions will change a lot of their employment. The call centers, the bank tellers, and all of the back-end work that is just moving information from one place to another. And I'm concerned about parts of the economy where those people are concentrated, or perhaps parts of the economy that are already depressed the retail stores lose their tellers, the grocery stores lose their checkout, the bank tellers go away all at the same time. What's going to happen to those people? And we have not been good. The United States hasn't been good. Most governments have not been good 
about coming up with policies to help displaced workers. And I think if we don't um, get better at that quickly, uh, we'll have a lot of unhappy people. So those are some of the risks I'm worried about as well. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. Um, I would like uh, to invite the panelists uh, as a follow-up to Susan uh, to give one main advantage and one challenge uh, related uh, to the development uh, of uh, fi new financial technologies and give the reasoning behind it. Mikhail? Good morning, dear friends. Uh, I would like uh, to welcome our clients. Uh, there's not a single bank that does not uh, cooperate with Ross Telecom. Ross Telecom is changing real, real fast. We were telephone companies. Now we are service uh, providers, uh, information storage, uh, cloud uh, technologies. Uh, that's what uh, Ross Telecom is about. Uh, that's what is consumed uh, real fast. Uh, of course, uh, we are thinking what to do in the future. A number of the Russian banks, and uh, Brett has referred to that, are uh, going to be internet company. We've been thinking about that because we have 55 million physical per persons as uh, clients and millions of legal persons. And we were kind of playing with the idea of becoming a bank. But the point is, we do not want to be a bank. We do not want to, want to be a holder of the paying system. We want uh, to remain a partner for the whole banking community on the whole. And uh, quite sincerely, I can say that uh, the association of uh, FinTech uh, set up the institutional environment uh, for that kind of activity. And one of the example is uh, the project of uh, the national uh, biometrical identification system. And uh, we will refer, refer to that in more details. The project uh, unites uh, both banks and uh, telecom companies. And I tend to agree with uh, Brett that the future rests uh, with the partnerships uh, between companies, the ability to uh, form partnership to, to earn will be the winners. But at the same time, it is important uh, to stay leaders, to remain leaders. And another task of the partnership uh, and for uh, Ross Telecom as well is uh, to develop the associations uh, with uh, the disruptive technologies developers. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, we will have uh, we will a presentation. And I would like to announce now that uh, we are pre prepared to provide uh, the technological platform, the digital sand box. Uh, if uh, you have products uh, related to the core activity of REST Telecom, we can prototype those uh, technologies. And uh, we do not face uh, the uh, hazard of uh, becoming a bank, but uh, it's a benefit for you. And, uh, not for us not to be a bank. What is uh, the uh, major uh, advantage uh, and uh, the major threat, uh, Mr. Mr. Sharma? I was uh, last year in June, I was in um, St. Petersburg when we had you know, shared some of our uh, sort of experiments what we did in India. I just want to share with you uh, what, uh, how we proceeded and I really like the, the keynote today. It's talked about design thinking, you know, how you do the first principle thinking. And therefore, when we designed the unique identity system in India, we essentially started what our problems are. One is, as you know, India has got 1.3 billion people. And there are a large number of them who do not have any formal identity documents. So identity becomes the first barrier uh, for inclusion in any kinds of system, whether it is a banking system or whether it is a social safety, safety net system. And therefore, we try to solve that problem. And of course, when you have multiple beneficiary systems and databases, you have a lot of duplicates and ghosts. 
So how do we design a unique identity system which is unique and which is also authenticable so that you can authenticate your identity in any online digital transaction? So therefore, we proceeded in July of 2009. We started and I happened to be the first CEO, founding CEO of that project and I worked there for four years. And we actually designed the system which is A, unique, and we used biometrics to ensure uniqueness, and B, authentication, and again, we use biometrics to authenticate. This is a system which is extremely frugal in terms of cost, just about a euro per person. So we are spending just about one and a half billion dollars on building that system, and we were doing one million identities per day, and that's how in five years we could scale up to one billion. So that's one part. Some of the features of this ID systems are A, it is online, so you don't have any smart cards, you don't have any you know, tokens because it's in a connected world. It also provides portability, which means I can authenticate myself, I am me, anywhere, anytime. It is just a number. It is also has no eligibility. It just proves basic identity. It does not say how much income I have or, or other kinds of attributes, so it's just a bare minimum ID system. It can be used as a plug-in to any delivery system. So you can now open a bank account sitting at home, authenticating yourself and, and just, uh, you know, this is the way it happens. So then it created these, these uh, systems. It also has, we have built a lot of other systems on top of it. So for example, we built a product called electronic KYC. And especially in banking context, it's very important because for banking you have to provide your identity documents and what we do now is when you go online and you authenticate yourself, the electronic KYC, which is a digitally signed identity document, digital document goes from the UID system database to the banking database, which means you can open a bank account without any paper, physical paper, fully authenticating yourself. So that's, that's one part. It also, this number also works as a universal financial address, which means if you want to transfer money to me, you just need to know my identity number, and that's just a 12-digit random number, by the way. It doesn't have, it doesn't disclose anything about me. It's a random number, 12-digit, and actually you have a space of 10 to the power 11, because it's a 12-digit, 12-digit is a check digit. So you have 100 billion number space out of which we use just 1.2 billion. We can create identities for the whole world whose population is just about 7 billion. So essentially, one, this can work like a financial address. So we do a lot of direct benefit transfers to people. For example, the social safety you know, net programs, we transfer money using this as a universal financial address. It is also completely interoperable in the sense that you, you, know, you can plug in in any platform. It is also public good, which means the authority which actually has delivered these numbers does not charge any money for authentication. And the entire banking industry is using it. Today we are having about 54 million transactions per day relating to authentication. So it has scaled up very fast. In India, we are now giving, for example, I am the regulator for telecom companies, and we are actually delivering, uh, you know, in just about five minutes, you can buy a telephone connection using your authentication. So these are the huge advantages. It is also an extremely, you know, frugal system in the sense that now you can do transactions without any cost. What we have also built is a trinity of the bank accounts, the unique identity Aadhaar, and the mobiles, what we call JAM. So it's actually, Janathan is essentially financial inclusion, Aadhaar and mobile. So what we have done is, we have uniquely linked the bank account with the unique ID number. We have also linked mobile with this ID number. And therefore, your mobile becomes your proxy identity. And then you can do all these transactions through mobile. So essentially, the, the entire banking industry, in terms of transactions, in terms of you know, opening bank accounts is, is hugely using this. It has reduced costs and also it is interoperable. So therefore, we've also built what is called a financial inclusion platform 
UPI, Unified Payment Interface. It's again a framework which prescribes the basic, you know, APIs, and using these APIs, you know, you can do interoperable banking transactions. These are some of the building blocks, and we are we are basically believe in building unbundled, unbundling the entire thing. So somebody else does the authentication, somebody, some other things do the transactions. So essentially, this kind of framework creates a scale, creates a very cost-effective solutions, and, and that's how it works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. Mr. Sharma has told us about uh, surprising advantages that uh, a digital ID system brings. Uh, many of us uh, heard, heard about this experience, and it was interesting for us to learn firsthand about it. But I have an additional question to Mr. Sharma. We are talking about uh, advantages and risks. Do you see any risks uh, from the development of technologies uh, uh, so that we know them and can uh, deal with them? I think, uh, thank you very much. This is an extremely important question because once you have a digital transaction at a scale, you also run into the risk of you know, doing all kinds of fraudulent uh, things. And I think there is not one single solution. There are multiple solutions which will have to be deployed. One is, of course, the consumer awareness, because you keep on getting all kinds of messages. And it's important for people not to fall in, in the trap. So one is you put a check on, on unsolicited commercial calls, SMSs. So that's one part is consumer education. Another is that you must have a very robust you know, transaction. So for example, this unique identity also offers what is called a digital consent, which means suppose I, uh, you know, some I want to let's say take a loan, and the the banks can just go and and search all my credit history. Now that's not really something which should be allowed in the sense that my privacy must be preserved. And what can happen in this world is you can have a digital token issued with the time to expire. And that token, you know, then authorizes the bank or the institution from whom I am asking for a loan to really go and, and, you know, talk to various entities, digitally present that token, and then get my information. So I think information protection is extremely, extremely important in terms of, in order to ensure that these, uh, you know, frauds and other kinds of uh, uh, things don't uh, happen. Uh, the the data-driven decision-making that's another very important uh, concept which should be employed. And uh, we should have the consumer education, as I said. Then the robust application-based standards. What's happening is, typically in many parts of the world, you have developed these mobile apps which do the banking. And it was certainly a very you know, shortcut way of solving basic problem of inclusion and cost effectiveness. But unfortunately, none of these applications are interoperable. And interoperability becomes extremely, extremely important. So if you have a robust platforms, which you know that these applications which I am using for financial transactions are safe, that kind of standardization and that kind of interoperability and those standards will have to be ensured so that the applications do not ferret, do not get your information and then can misuse that information. So I think in a digital world, what is important is a consumer education, robust building of these applications, ensuring that they follow certain standards and open APIs, open standards are extremely important. And lastly, they are interoperable. And I think these are some of the building blocks, some of the things which should be employed in order to ensure that you are protected in a digital world. Last point I'd like to make is Unfortunately, regulation is falling behind in, in many of these digital areas. For example, who owns my data? That's an extremely important question. What happens is many of these technology companies, big companies, you know, in the name of protecting privacy, they have their data privacy policies. And these data privacy policies are not really privacy, you know, protecting the privacy of my data. 
these are essentially my consent to say how they can use or misuse my data. So essentially, we need to have a law. We need to have some broad regulation on data ownership, data privacy, and data security. And these things will go a long way in ensuring that the fraudulent transactions and fraudulent kind of things are, are prevented. Thank you very much. Uh, that you have raised some very important uh, issues. Olga, what do you see as the major advantage and major risk? Uh, when uh, we uh, discussed uh, the um, issue of who we want to be or what we want to be uh, in the next 15 years, we decided we are not going to be a telecom company. So I think we were on the same wave as Mikhail. So partnership between telecoms and banks and regulators that are building a unique and single system of coordinates, this is the key to success. And I believe that the main uh, driver that will make both telecoms and uh, banking and financial institutions to uh, address customers' needs uh, is uh, the building of universal services uh, regulated by uh, government authorities so that each of us um, does what they can do best uh, so that they don't waste their time on standard uh, tasks. Uh, today, as we can use uh, identity uh, uh, to open accounts, uh, we need to build a unique uh, biometric platform. As our colleague from India has uh, told us, it's a guarantee that all government services and all services built on that um, digital identification can develop faster. And if it's a national biometric platform, if it begins to operate within three years for us, the cost of a service uh, will go dramatically down. And then when answering the question uh, whether we can become a technology company, I think we can make another step forward because we're not going to think about the technology standards uh, in biometry or form factors that our um, customers need to hold in their hands. Uh, and then uh, it will be the government that will assume the responsibility for the security of customer data in our services. The amount of efforts that we as institutions and part of the financial system spend on um, protect data protection and integrity is a considerable share of our costs. So any opportunity of partnership and of building unique and single um, databases, unified uh, storage of, uh, of data that uh, we can have access to will enable us to develop faster a lot. And uh, the Association of Financial Technology, what it is doing uh, is, in fact, uh, creating such uh, uniform system of coordinates to assure those uh, universal services. But the basic risk is the human factor, the factor of a human sitting behind a computer. And it, it, in any event, initial entry of data is uh, carried out by uh, humans. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, talk about uh, blockchains and distance registers uh, as much as we can, but those who enter and key in data are still humans. So uh, the question is uh, for uh, that we need to the question we need to address is to assure better protection in that regard. Now, Oleg. Well, uh, I have. Um, no good news for Mikhail because in two months we are launching Tinkoff Mobile and we want to be a mobile company, although based on telecom networks, uh, we still go into that because a year ago we discussed uh, convergence, uh, if you remember, and I even predicted that the Ministry of Communications well, at some point, uh, merge with the central bank, but maybe I'm looking too far ahead, although 
as uh, Tinkoff Bank's uh, practice uh, has indicated, we uh, looked into the future 10 years ago. And now we can see that everybody is following in our footsteps um, today. So we were able to foresee, uh, to some extent, the future of the banking system. So I uh, predict uh, convergence uh, between telecoms and banks. Um, so personal data exchange will be um, absolutely necessary to meet customers changing needs and um, I could also uh, um, tell my colleague from India and maybe and other colleagues uh, like Durov and others. Uh, as a matter of fact, I see no big problem with personal data. Uh, for example, myself, me as a human, I uh, do not mind um, uh, having. Uh, I do not mind. Uh, uh, law enforcement authorities having access to my personal data. And what uh, does that uh, mean if it leaks? Uh, well, they learn what your uh, phone number is. Uh, I see no tragedy in that. Uh, there's a lot of speculation and maybe uh, um, too, too much uh, uh, a caution about it. Uh, those terabytes of uh, data are simply uh, uh, is simply something that you cannot actually use. Of course, there are some risks with fraud, and among the risks, uh, I can see uh, possibilities uh, that uh, some payments may not go through within short terms if it's about uh, digital banking. Yes, some risks uh, do exist, but they're so insignificant compared to the advantages and conveniences that uh, we have. Just think uh, now right here from our mobile phone, we can transfer money to our uh, wives or girlfriends uh, or children. And uh, now, if you have a Tinkoff mobile um, app or, or a Sberbank app, you can uh, carry out whatever you want uh, right from your phone. It was impossible just five years ago. It's extremely convenient for the customers. And uh, the small risks that there are, I believe they're marginal and uh, 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 really negligible compared to the advantages of digital banking and the conveniences our customers receive. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I agree with you. And uh, of course, the new advantages that are interesting to the new technologies over overweight. It is uh, convenience, uh, comfort, uh, cheapness. It's a new way of life. Uh, and. Uh, be all that is because of the application of new technologies. I am a representative of the regulator, and I always tell that we have to think about the risks to prevent them and uh, to mitigate them and to give a chance for the new technologies to develop without pe people and business being afraid of using them. And uh, one of the subjects, uh, it is identity or personal data protection, and we will discuss uh, this uh, topic. And uh, many specialists uh, say that uh, there is a change in attitude towards the protection of personal d data. What should be protected? What is important for a person in protecting personal data, but still we should uh, provide uh, the protection of the data that uh, the customers uh, think is important for them. And uh, I don't think the new technologies will abolish that kind of approach. And uh, anyway, we will uh, look into this uh, challenge uh, at uh, the sessions. Of course, the protection of the consumer's rights from fraudulent uh, transactions, uh, uh, the continuity of the services uh, provided by new technologies are, are an important thing. I would like to discuss in more details on some subjects, and uh, one being the development of the infrastructure for new digital finance. Olga has referred that we shouldn't uh, duplicate uh, doing things uh, 
incurring costs, and uh, it is important uh, for the state uh, to take up the responsibility for the infrastructure, reducing the expenses of the participants of the new finance landscape. We are aware that uh, many companies uh, of financial sector, first of all, large companies with huge resources are prepared to establish that kind of infrastructures. And they believe that uh, they can uh, develop the infrastructure faster and cheaper than those things done under the auspices of the regulator. And if the infrastructural services will be provided by one national major uh, or two, it will result in a new monopoly, a monopoly of a new type. And this issue is being highly debated at uh, different venues. Uh, there are some uh, necess there are necessary conditions for infrastructural conditions for the development uh, of the digital finance services. I would like to uh, ask uh, Michael a question. And you, I think the uh, answer is obvious because you're an infrastructure company. So what should be done and why, Michael? Money is the underpinning force that uh, rolls the world, uh, including the decision taken. And each bank, when taking a decision on how to develop uh, the infrastructure, uh, how uh, to spend uh, investments on what parts of their business. And uh, the service model when financial organization, finance organization, transfers some of the functions to such companies as Ross Telecom are uh, urgent. Uh, our data center, our cloud technologies, our applications are getting higher demand. And even the top five banks uh, switch over to that uh, type of business models. And we discuss it even with you of uh, uh, eventualities of using the cloud technologies to store information. Of course, the service business model will be dominating not only in the finance sector, but uh, for the industrial companies, for public uh, companies. And uh, so that's why we are looking forward to its uh, development. Of course, it's a competitive uh, capt ma captive market, and uh, there are telecom operators telecom companies and uh, banks, uh, whether they are willing or not, will have uh, to offer that kind of services. But uh, it's a market choice. Uh, any entity can make SWOT analysis to look into the opportunities uh, and the hazards to analyze the risks. And uh, I think there will be forms and formats uh, to develop infrastructure at the new landscape. Of course, uh, Ross Telecom is a key player, not only for banks, uh, but uh, for the country on the whole, providing services to physical persons and uh, businesses. Uh, and uh, we are taking care of the safety and security. And uh, we are available at the market. And we always uh, think on how to make our services uh, competitive and uh, cost eff effective. So we are in favor of the service uh, business model. Ross Telecom is your business partner. OK. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, anyone willing to comment on uh, infrastructure? Mr. Sharma, please. I think uh, that's an extremely important question because, you know, one gets a feeling that it's always advantageous to have one player, you know, doing everything and all kinds of data uh, residing there. But I think what is important is that A, the, the domains must continue to do their jobs. So, for example, in India, the identity platform must not do banking. I mean, the banking is, is one particular area. So, so essentially, the federated data model whereby ID platform provides identity services, banking platform provides the banking services, and telecom provides telecom services. That should continue. And, and actually, that's the, the basic ground for innovations on top of it. Because once you have these federated data model, this creates unbundling. It creates those platforms. And then you can create products on top of that. So those, that should be one of the you know, models which should work. Infrastructure-wise, what will happen is that certainly, you know, the clouds and, and the blockchains and the other technologies will continue to play their role, and they will continue to reduce the cost and reduce the friction in a financial transaction or any kind of transaction. So that 
should continue to happen. On the regulatory side, I think it's important that the regulation must keep pace with these new technologies and platforms. But I am one of the view that regulation should not mean the you know, unbundling philosophy must continue in that also. So for example, there are many who think that the telecom regulators and the banking regulators must in a way get converged. My view is that telecom regulator must regulate the telecom because telecom is essentially pipes. In these pipes, you flow financial information, you flow agriculture, you flow all kinds of information, and you telecom regulator cannot regulate everything. So the domain industry must continue to be regulated by the domain regulator, and the telecom pipes must be continuing to be regulated by the telecom. And of course, there has got to be convergence in some sense, because there may be certain areas which may just be left out, and those areas will have to be you know, converged and those areas will have to be regulated. So regulators have to be fast, flexible, and of course they have to regulate not through as, as you know in the, in the modding itself, uh, the, the keynote speaker said that it's a code which should regulate. It should not be the, you know, the usual processes and procedures. So I think from an infrastructural standpoint, unbundling is the way to go. Of course, the, the risk which exists in those the essentially data leakage lists, uh, risks, and they have to be kind of taken care of. Otherwise, the responsibility fixation as to where the data leaked from it will, will become a difficult uh, proposition. So that, that should be something which we should guard against. In India, as you know, the uh, Supreme Court declared that privacy is a fundamental right. And therefore, we have to be more careful in terms of ensuring data protection and data privacy. Thanks. As a follow-up, I would like to touch upon two subjects. The service model, which we talk about, uh, it's about the role and the responsibility of the state for the business entities is based on the necessity uh, to uh, rethink of uh, what is the identificator for physical persons. Because uh, we say that uh, physical persons have a passport identifying us. And traditionally, conventionally, in the banking, we look into that kind of uh, a passport trying to authentic authenticate it. And uh, the system used in uh, India is uh, calling uh, the person a person and uh, identifying the person. And there are many attributes uh, that describe the, the person. And if the service model and the responsibility of the uh, state uh, make it possible for the state uh, to have a dream that uh, the digital identification and different digital identity is some kind of uh, digital entry with the attributes uh, added uh, through the whole lifespan, then the responsibility of those uh, who develop the platform and who can supervise them and who should be responsible for the data shifts uh, to the state. Because uh, when we talk uh, about uh, the knowledge uh, about the, the persons, uh, then the utmost and foremost role of the state is uh, great. But the telecoms and the other company could be service operators. And uh, the par partnership model, when the state uh, sets standards, sets the requirements, and uh, sets uh, the pace of movement in these uh, directions, and that uh, empowers the operators, is a uh, uh, standard model that uh, can uh, allow the market uh, to do business. And uh, when we refer uh, to the consumer's market, we tend uh, to forget uh, what the situation is in the Russian Federation. The share of uh, the income of the banks uh, between the transaction from physical persons and the corporate sector is uh, a ratio of uh, 50 by 50 in our sector, for example. So when we talk about uh, sexy interface, mobile devices, the uh, fine concept of the change of uh, the behavior of the c consumers, we mostly talk about the physical persons. But uh, when we recall that the share of the SMEs is not high, 
and uh, the large companies and uh, middle companies have uh, pr generate a great share of uh, GNP of Russia. We return to the world which is far away from the digital transformation we are talking about. And uh, the people who has look so happy when using Tinkoff or Sberbank online applications, they get to their working place uh, in uh, the large corporation, they open MS Excel, uh, shuffling papers on the table, and they keep on doing the routine operation that uh, they've been uh, doing for the past uh, 10 years. We have a client and we print out uh, all the transactions for the past week. We put the files into the boxes and uh, they take the trolleys uh, of uh, trolley loads of those paper. 21st century. And uh, we at that, we are discussing digital transformation with the visionaries. Then the question is what the national platform should be to identify legal persons to ensure digital transformation of the transaction of the legal persons in the finance uh, sector, inside the finance sector with all the ministries that own that kind of information to be the same as is available at the physical persons uh, that is changing the channel of transfer information to introduce uh, KYC, not for physical persons, but for legal entities. And uh, we work with a lot because when we talk about mobile devices and physical persons, what are the tasks? It is uh, looking nice, safety, and then cost. But if it is legal, then the priority is uh, safety uh, and uh, uh, safety, then uh, uh, functionality, protection, and uh, then the, the, the cost. And unfortunately, there are not much changes uh, at the legal person's market. But uh, the universal services should be developed. That's what we should do. And uh, we should shift the responsibility for that on. Uh, the uh, state uh, and uh, we in the doing so we should not forget about the legal persons because uh, they demand they require the same approach uh, as in uh, the digital transformation and the physical persons thanks Alga has touched upon an important uh, issue and the financial technologies penetrate the financial services